Good morning and welcome to worship. I am Pastor Judith Youngman, interim pastor of Pilgrim Church in Duluth, Minnesota. So glad we are worshiping together. Good morning. I am Pastor Koki Kanki. I serve uh, with the Associated Church in Owatonna. Thank you for connecting with us and for members of the Associated Church. This is an official announcement that we will have our annual administrative meeting in November. There is an online meeting on November 22nd that you can zoom into and that information will come to you in writing. Ballots will be mailed out. So that is the business that churches get involved in. Let us take a deep breath and be connected to God's spirit. Please take a deep settling breath and another as we ready ourselves for worship. Call upon God's wisdom and she will answer. Seek God's wisdom for she dwells in the midst of life. Follow God's wisdom for she leads in the paths of light and generosity. Let us pray. Holy God, we hear echoes of your wisdom in Christ Jesus, the one you sent to dwell in our midst and lead us to abundant life. Keep us alert to the call to follow, ready to respond with justice and joy in your holy moment, which is always now. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Look around. Wherever you are in this moment, you are not alone. God is present with you. Take a moment for reflection. God's grace flows through our lives, refreshing and making all things new. Let this grace flow from us as justice and righteousness, that our lives and work may bless our world. In Jesus' name, amen.
piece. Good morning, everyone. I have a question for you. Other than people and God, do you have a guess of what the most mentioned living thing in the Bible is? Do you have a guess? Trees. A friend recently shared a, a really interesting article with me by Matthew Sleeth. It was called The Arbor of God. And the author states, do you think trees are beautiful? You're in good company. God loves trees too. Think about it. Think about the Bible stories you know, times you've heard about Jesus, the stories that you've heard in church. Do you remember Zacchaeus? He climbed a tree to see Jesus. Do you remember that Jesus and his father were both carpenters, which meant they worked with trees to create useful items for other people. And in our church, a Christian church, you often see a wood cross representing our faith. Well, I've been thinking about this a lot. And I think God loves trees because they're beautiful and they give us life and they give us shade. And thinking about it, I think trees can teach us a lot about God. So I want you to look around. Can you look out a window right now? Do you see trees? What kind do you see? How many can you see? Do they look the same today? as they did three months ago. I asked a bunch of the Pilgrim Youth Group uh, members to send me their favorite pictures of trees that they've taken. I'm going to show them to you with my ideas about all the reasons I love trees and how they bring me hope and stability in life right now. I want you to think about times where you think trees make you really happy or remind you of the lessons that you've learned in the Bible, in Sunday school, and through your faith, how you think they might remind you of God. Are you ready? Let's take a look. Trees, they nourish us with their fruit. They create joy for the climbers. They offer peace for the hammockers, shelters for the birds. They provide beauty. They give us perspective. And like people, there are all different types of trees. Large trees, smaller trees, showy, stable, young, and old, strong, struggling. And like trees, I think we are all really individually beautiful but kind of amazing when we're all together. I think trees also remind us that sometimes we need to change and adapt with the seasons. Trees remind us that growth takes time and patience. So this week, pay attention to the trees around you. Think about how they can bring you joy and happiness 
and strength to them and how you might do the same for other people. Holy One, open our hearts and our minds for the word you would have us hear. Amen. Our first reading is from the First Testament, Joshua chapter 21, verses 1 to 3a and 14 to 25. The people of Israel are now residents of Canaan. According to this book, the conquest is complete. The land has been divided among the tribes. We leap forward to the final chapter of the book. Our reading describes a treaty between God and his people. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah, and his sons Abraham and Neher, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, for it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Jesus has told a parable about a master who leaves his estate, then suddenly and unexpectedly returns. Now he tells another parable about the unexpected coming of the kingdom of God. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. 
But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all of those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You'd better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. week this has been. Most likely we're in for more surprises in the weeks ahead. Nothing is as we have experienced it before. We are in uncharted territory with this recent presidential election, with this impending change in leadership. It's not hyperbole to say that for those of us of a certain demographic, um, we remember other times and other days. It was once quite predictable, well, at least predictable, the ways in which one administration handed over the reins of government to the next. And so we have high hopes based on memories of the way things used to be. But we're not living in the used to be land. We're living in the here and now. For younger people, the way things are may well be the only way they know it to be. Anger, hostility, belittling, put-downs, this is what politicians too long have trafficked in. Turning neighbors against neighbors, towns against cities, rural against urban. 
all too many days of anger and hostility in our national discourse. And for young people, perhaps all they've ever known. But for those of us who are older, we are likely to say that this is different than any time we can remember, but there are other times that came close. Oh, not in the way the Office of the Presidency has been conducted particularly, but in the ways people have been pitted against each other around issues of war and peace. There have been times of upheaval, times of discontent and anger, times when family members turned against family members over politics. And it's quite common to hear that there are two things you should never discuss in polite society, and that would be politics and religion. There are other things you don't discuss in polite society, but those two always lead the list. And it's really odd when you think about it because we live in the midst, in the middle of both of those, religion and politics. If we pause and look deep within, we may recognize that what we think about who God is may well frame our politics. Think about it. Who we think or feel who God is in Jesus and in the presence of the Holy Spirit may be at the center of decisions people make of what they expect of themselves, of their community, and of the government. And even the church. It is certainly worth a thought, I think. In times of upheaval and change, people look to a leader, someone who will comfort, someone who will stand on the side of the people, someone who knows and cares about us and our lives and our dreams and our visions. Sometimes leaders are appointed. Sometimes they are elected. Sometimes they arise from the people. And in this story this morning that we read, Joshua is such a leader. He rose from the people. He was the right hand of Moses, and he inherited the mantle of leadership from Moses after Moses died. And the story we have been following in the First Testament is about people who are used by God for specific purposes arising from specific circumstances. And for several months we have been following the story of the people of Israel, how a people were gathered and formed and led by Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses, and I would put Miriam in that mix. Each one of them with a role to play in the covenant promises between God and God's people. Well, after Moses' death, Joshua became the leader with the charge to finish the journey, to lead them to the promised land. And he has. He's led them there. They have arrived. They have finished the journey. And then the question becomes, how do they live? The journey was known, but now they're settled. How do they live? They could look back on the journey and relate the stories to their children and to their children's children. But then there came a time in which they had to choose. How were they going to live in a settled land? Who was God for them in a settled land? Was God only the God of the journey? Or was God the God of a settled land? How did they live in this new place and this time that was foreign to them? And how did they live with people that were different from them and worshipped other gods? 
To arrive at the destination required a reminder not of who they were, but of who they are now called to be. How then shall they live becomes the question. Reread to you. Listen for these words in Joshua. Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. How does this relate to our times? And I propose that we are not builders, we're settlers. That we have learned to accommodate ourselves. We have memories of the church and its past. We have memories of the church's place in the community. Where's God in those memories? And where is God now? Just like the people of Joshua's time had to wrestle with the idea who God was of the journey from one place to the next. They had to wrestle with the idea of who God is now. When the journey seems to be an end and the promise fulfilled, Are we settlers or are we builders or are we both? In an article by Old Testament professor Walter Brueggemann, an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ, he speaks to the church of our time and he says that we are called to a dangerous oddness. That we have arrived at a time of choice we either sign on uncritically to the powers that surround us, or we take on the prophetic task of exposing the contradictions and performing the alternatives. The prophetic task of exposing the contradictions and performing the alternatives. The prophets of old were deeply grounded in the covenantal traditions and the wisdom traditions. They knew there were structures and limits inherent in the way of creation that could not be violated with impunity. They have a strong notion of the governance of God, but along with that sense of tradition, they have a strong sense of social reality. And the task before the church today is that as a covenant community, we are to recover the prophetic task. We are to look around us, really look around us, and see and refuse to accept the way things are. We do not always have to have the poor with us. We do not accept homelessness as acceptable. We do not agree that a small number of people own the majority of the wealth of the world. This is upside down. In need of prophetic imagination turned into action to be turned right side up. Brueggemann says further, if you take the phrase prophetic imagination, the imagination part is that the prophets are able to imagine the world other than the way that it is in front of them. The prophetic alludes to the reality of God. What was the reality for the Israelites of God in the place they journeyed to? 
They recognize the reality of God in the journey itself. Because every time they strayed from the purpose for which they traveled, God reminded them. But now they're settled. What is the reality of God in a settled place? For me and for you, for our society, for our church, for our communities. The prophetic alludes to the reality of God. What the prophets believe deeply is that God is a lively character and a real agent who acts in the world who causes endings and who causes new beginnings. And that is worth thinking about because that is not an ordinary thinking among us, that God is a lively agent and a real character. So prophetic imagination is grounded in the conviction that God is doing something lively in the world, that it may be slow, but it is very sure and that a new world is coming into being that will discredit and dismiss the old. This is the way it has always been, and it all will always be. For the Israelites in the Promised Land, for the church in 2020 and 21, we're at a choice point. Joshua's call to the people of Israel reminded me of we the people from America's founding documents. And I wonder if we the people who are so accustomed to making our own laws as a matter of principle, if we independent, individualistic people will be able to hear Joshua's strong call to fear, to serve, and to obey the one true God. Many of our contemporaries will hear that as a call to patriarchal subservience that lessens us rather than a loving call to a service that fulfills our true destiny. So who is God for us? Are we on a journey or have we arrived? Just what does prophetic imagination mean for pilgrim church, mean for associated church? Who are we? What is our mandate? How do we live in this land in which we're settled? Are we settled? Or is there a new day? Is there a way that through this time of COVID that we are being led on a journey in which we can reclaim a prophetic imagination? We can reclaim an understanding that we are and always shall be a pilgrim people. Answering the call of God to be journeying even if we stay in place, to not stand still, but to dream and vision a better way, to be who we are called to be, to be who we are blessed to be, Are we settlers or are we builders? Do we have a prophetic imagination? To what and with whom are we being called? Amen. As we consider the world around us, creation and its people, let us be generous in the giving of our lives and our finances to make things better. Let us rejoice that we have an offering to make in celebration of our relationship through God, through, with God through Christ. Let us give our lives.
As we come into a time of prayer, when we can hold one another's griefs and joys to God together, where we know that strength and the power of being embraced in one spirit, let us pray with thanksgiving for the veterans who have served our country over so many generations. Let us pray for Mary and those who are facing illnesses and surgeries and recoveries. Let us pray for those who grieve, for Tara's college roommate and her husband who lost a pregnancy at 27 weeks, for the Amali Larsons still after Emily's death, and for the Kidders following Mike's death. Let us be together in the spirit of prayer. Blessing God. You created the trees and the wind, the ground beneath our feet, the sky above us, the light of the sun, the changing seasons, all things that give, you a, give us a sense of who you are. And you set us, our, your human beings, free to create and to envision and to invent, to be entrepreneurs, to come up with all sorts of new things, like fire and wheels and technology, computers and the internet and all of these things. So we give you thanks this morning for the possibilities of the tools that have been invented by your people. And frankly, we will continue to pray that they work. We give you thanks for the changing of seasons that will be so evident between a week of warmth and a week of chill. We give you thanks that as people in this United States, we had an opportunity to vote and to converse and to consider the leadership for us. Be with those who celebrate results and be with those who mourn them. But most of God, oh God as we go through these transitions, state levels, county levels, city levels, national levels, create in us, all of us, a huge desire for connection and peace and improvement. Open our ears and our hearts to the true values so that we can find ways to work together to make life better for everyone, which is our purpose from you. Give us, oh God, the tears that we shed. Give us, oh God, the ways that we connect with one another, close in families, outside with friends, over telephones, with those further away. And let us remember day after day that it is being connected that makes a difference. Help us to gain new ways to connect with you so that our lives in the world will be connecting. And as the wind blows, and it always blows with change, free us, free us from the things that hold us back and allow us to follow your spirit as she blows. We ask these things in the name of the one we follow, the one who taught disciples to pray, our Amen. Father who art Amen. in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. may seem settled, you and I and our communities, but we're very much a people on a journey, making decisions on a daily basis practically about how we will serve the Lord and who is the Lord of our lives and our communities. As we go from this time together, go with both a question, a prayer, and a song in your hearts. Go knowing that you are blessed, you are called. Now go from this time to your various places to serve God with joy, sharing love, the love of the one who is known to us as creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Amen. <laughs>